welcome to another episode of Healthy for My Purpose. We are so excited today. We have Dr. Janelle Gordon with us today, and we're going to have a real holistic conversation about the importance of lifestyle medicine um, and just lifestyle changes to better your health. So let's just jump right in. Thank you, Dr. Janelle Gordon, for coming to our podcast. Thank you, PG and Cersei. Thank you for having me. Awesome. So we're going to jump right in. Could you just give us a little bit of your story? Like, how did you um, start doing a plant-based diet? Tell us your story. Sure. So I'd like to take people back to the time when I was in residency training in Baltimore, Maryland for family medicine. And at that time, living on the coast, I found myself eating more and more seafood. So I'd say I was like a pescatarian by default. I would still eat animal products outside of like fish. I would eat beef and pork, turkey, chicken. But usually the beef and pork was more so if I were like eating out, especially like after a long call shift in the hospital, I found myself going to a fast food restaurant. I try not to mention names, but it was a chain restaurant. Like, oh, I'm so stressed. I need a big juicy burger and a, and a fry, right? And so, but for the house, I would only have like fish, okay? Fish, seafood. And then I moved home and I kind of reabsorbed my usual diet, I'd say, or nutrition. And I was still eating animal products at that time. Around the time when the pandemic hit, I found myself not being able to really find the fresh seafood that I wanted. And of course, we most of us had more time on our hands. So I started doing more and more research. I was studying for my obesity medicine boards around that time. And I found myself just slowly venturing towards a more plant-based diet. I wouldn't say it was significantly whole food plant-based at that time. And honestly, I've always, what I thought, eaten pretty healthy since I was a child. My mom made sure we had fresh fruits, vegetables, et cetera. And there was a time in elementary school where I said, I'm not eating pork ever, ever again. We had watched the movie Gordy, told my mom and dad I was giving up pork. They bought turkey bacon, you know, because that's better. And I lasted about 30 days. But then I thought, no, I miss bacon. I love bacon. You know what I mean? I don't know how people are vegetarian or vegan. You have events in med school and residency. You have to make sure you have a plant-based diet option. I thought, why? You know? Anyway, so back to 2020, as we're in the pandemic and more and more research that I do, I found myself switching over to significantly plant-based diet. I would still like venture into dairy, but mainly when I was eating out. And so that's 2020. So as I continued through my studying for obesity medicine boards, and then I decided to take on lifestyle medicine, that's when I really started transitioning from a plant-based, just like vegan diet and lifestyle to an actual whole food plant-based nutrition. And I'm still continually evolving. Awesome. So why did you choose lifestyle medicine as a career path and kind of what impact are you seeing with your clients? Sure. So I'm traditionally trained as a family medicine physician, as I said, trained in Baltimore, Maryland, at the University of Maryland. When I got into practice as an attending, what we call an attending physician, I found myself not really having all the tools that I feel I needed to actually help patients lead healthier lives. So sure, I had the latest medications, the patients needed procedures, I could refer them to the appropriate specialist, but oftentimes patients would come back and they'd have side effects from medications, I may need to start an additional medication, or a lot of these patients were even on medications. They didn't even know what they were for. They had been on them for years and years and years. And you try to talk to them about, mm, your kidney function's declining. I think we should consider stopping. No, 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 I need that medicine. Oh, what do you take that medicine for? I don't know, but the doctor said I have to take it. Okay, right? And so I had a patient who came to me during those first two years after training or residency training. And she had high cholesterol. And so because of my training, I talked to her about putting her on a cholesterol-lowering medication called a statin. And I want to say, just because I lead a whole food plant-based diet and I do practice lifestyle medicine does not mean that there's not a place for medications, procedures, surgeries, et cetera. But we need to tailor it to the patient in front of us. And we really need to use multiple modalities in order to help people lead healthier lives. So the woman came to me and she said, well, I really don't want to take that medicine. A lot of people worry about side effects with any medicine. For statins, a lot of people worry about like the muscle cramps that are often advertised. And so she asked me about doing plant-based. And I thought, sure, have at it. You know, I mean, I didn't think she'd be very successful. So I told her, let's have you come back in three months. This woman came back to me, you guys. And her cholesterol levels had dropped significantly. I mean, I was shocked. She gifted me How Not to Die by Dr. Michael Greger. I'd never heard of this man. I've since ran into him and met him several times at conferences. But 
I thought, how have I never heard of this man? And even though I thought I was eating healthy all this time, how did I not know about this way of living and all the data that supports reducing chronic disease? At that time, I still was only studying for obesity medicine now. So fast forward to last year, 2022, the beginning of the year, I took the plant-based nutrition course through the T. Colin Campbell and E. Cornell, T. Colin Campbell Center for Nutrition Studies and E. Cornell. And that's when I really started doing the deeper dive into plant-based nutrition. And the more and more data that I review, it's just very hard to refute that this doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that story because, you know, it kind of, it, you're, you're resonating with me because my story um, was similar to this woman's in the sense that back in 2007, I went in to see my doctor for a routine wellness exam. They did both the lipid panel and a carotid artery scan of my neck. And, um, and my, my, um, LDL and triglycerides were really high and my, um, lit, my carotid artery scan showed that I had the arteries of a 46 year old, but I was only 35 at the time. And wow. I refused the statin drug that my doctor wanted to put me on too. And, um, and, and your comment, he said it wasn't realistic. Like that's not practical or realistic for me to not take this drug and just try to do it on my own. Cause I kind of knew I wasn't taking good care of myself. And I um, had learned about the work of Dr. Dean Ornish and his lifestyle heart trial, um, which was conducted back in the 1990s, which is crazy. I mean, it's crazy. crazy. Everybody, I mean, very medical, crazy right? everybody in medical school needs to like study that, like read that study and know it inside and out because that never had heard of it. Isn't that, I mean, that's just, it's crazy how that, that happens. But I, um, I never went back to my doctor, like your patient did, um, mm -hmm. largely because I ended up moving. I ended up relocating from my job. Um, okay. but, um, and, and it was, and it also took me another five years <laughs> to figure it out. <laughs> to, I was, to, I, to see I was, a doctor? No, no, to, to, to completely eliminate animal products. Oh, from okay. Because I, I, yes, I, yes. She wasn't a quick study like your lady there, I guess. Yeah, your, your, <laughs> lady was, your lady was very obedient with the, with the cause. I was not. I, so what happened was I went from eating that standard American. And when I say standard American diet, I wasn't eating fast food. I was just eating at mm -hmm. restaurants. You know, I was just eating right. at sit down restaurants, you know, and, you know, there'd be these platters of chicken fajitas mm. with cheese and, you know, sour cream and all this other stuff. Or I would go to a steakhouse, you know, because I was in a corporate job and that's where we would typically, you know, go to yeah. eat for business. And, um, and so it was like, I went from that to what the government said was a quote unquote healthy diet, you know? It was, I think it was the pyramid back then. It wasn't the my plate yeah. yet, but it was the pyramid. So I was eating, I think I was eating about four, five servings of fruits and vegetables a day. Um, and I would use poultry and, and less red meat, you know, and low fat dairy instead of full fat dairy. And my cholesterol went from horrible and stayed in that borderline bad zone for like five years. And it wasn't until... I went completely whole food plant-based mm -hmm. that it reversed altogether. And my cholesterol just dipped down into the healthy and I'm 52 now, and it's still in that healthy range without medication. And, um, and so it's, it's, it's amazing how not only just amazing how, you know, the food is really medicine in our bodies, but just how, um, people are unaware, including, you know, including like people, you know, doctors who are trained in medical school don't get that nutrition education. So, you know, kudos for going on and learning more about lifestyle medicine. Mm -hmm. And because it's, it's, I think a, a travesty when people look to their doctors to give them nutrition advice and they're not necessarily formally trained in it. What's your thoughts on that? Yes. And so I want to make sure that we don't end up demonizing the healthcare field because we go into this field because we want to help people. Right. Honestly. I mean, you may have people who go for different reasons, but most of us yeah. are empathetic and we really want to help people either cure disease, 
improve their disease or prevent it. I mean, that's my goal. I'm yeah. always trying to be on the right. forefront of like, let's not even see these numbers dip into the concerning range. But it's not our fault, right? No, like no, we are going not. based off of what is taught to us and what has continually been taught to us throughout the generations. And you have people like Dr. Dean Ornish, Dr. Caldwell Usselstyn, who did these studies and they were often ostracized by the mm, medical community. I mean, when you talk to these individuals at the conferences or hear them speak, it's like, wow, you really stood on mm -hmm. what you believed, even though you had colleagues within your department threatening to put you out. Mm -hmm. And that would put you at risk of not even being able to obtain a position with another university mm, or yes. private practice. And so that's why a lot of this information <clears throat> wasn't brought to those of us who are practicing now, not just physicians, but you have nurses, you have health coaches, nutritionists, et cetera. But what I will say is more and more is being brought to students mm -hmm. today because people want the information, especially now in the digital age. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have to get ahead of all, all of this fake news, right? <laughs> and false evidence. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, after the White House Conference on Hunger, Health and Nutrition last year, there's mm -hmm. been a lot of work to get this information out to students, at least for medical schools. And you also have Congress. Like there have been bills brought forth stating that we do not get the nutrition um, education that we're supposed to receive. Right. And it's supposed to be around 25 hours. And that's been in place since like the 80s. Yeah. However, it's not done. If you poll, many of us today will say, oh yeah, you know, we had nutrition squeezed in in our biochemistry course mm -hmm. and that's people, what do you remember? Not much, right? Yeah. So when you go see these individuals and you're seeking care, I would be mindful and try not to find fault, but I often encourage people to bring information to me that they see online or in a book mm -hmm. and then we go together. And I may not have the answer for you right away, but I'll say, let me review that. Let me look into it. I'll get back to you. I am afforded more time with my patients today in the practice where I work. So I oftentimes will look at things online and we'll review it together, but still I may need to get back to them later. So I would encourage people to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I do think I do think doctors do go into medicine because they want to help people. Mm -hmm. But I also think that doctors are tied up in a system mm -hmm. that's more focused on making money than helping people. And and I think that uh, and and so we we don't need to go down that <laughs> that hole today. Oh, we can if you okay. like. <laughs> I mean, it's true. Every yeah. physician that I've sought out, I have ensured that my pay is not based on the care that I deliver. Now, right. there are incentives now if you're doing quality over quantity, but mm -hmm. most people still are very much working in a quantity model. Mm -hmm. And come on, these are businesses. We have to be able to make money yeah. in order to pay people and keep lights on mm -hmm. and keep well. But oftentimes there is a, a sway towards profit, right? Right. over really people. And sometimes I find myself standing alone saying no, and not just for the well-being of individuals, but also the well-being of providers. So yes. I'm finishing up my fellowship with the American Academy of Family Physicians for leading mm -hmm. physician well-being. And so your healthcare providers, I want anyone who sees this in America, mm -hmm. we are tired. Yeah. yeah. Tired. We mm -hmm. continue to show up every day and try to deliver care, especially during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. I mean, people time away from their families feeling like they were inadequate they didn't have what it took to be yeah. able to take care of patients because we didn't have the information we have people in positions who are not clinical who are telling us what we need to do yeah. recently someone said to a colleague <clears throat> to, the, to the providers you just need to suck it up and see these patients whoa all the while their administrative time is being cut back all the while the patient visits are being cut back and so patients come in and they say oh well the doctor only spent 10 minutes with me we do not make these times. And many of us are fighting to get more time. Right. Many of us are staying up hours on end. I was just at a conference and a colleague said to me, you know, my family, they don't really get it. They think I only work 40 hours, but really I'm working 70. Mm. And that those extra 30 hours are in order to chart, to get back to you with patient calls, to review your messages now that we're in this telemedicine or digital healthcare space. So it's not to say, you know, just, give everybody a, oh, it's okay, or excuse for mm. what's in front of you. But do know that those of us who are often rendering the care are not the ones making these decisions. Oh, but yeah, that does sure. mean that mm -hmm. we need more of us in those positions to really affect change and improve the healthcare system. Yeah, it's really, it's really tricky. I mean, I, um, I was reading some statistics about healthcare providers. Um, when you look at, you know, the pillars of lifestyle medicine, 
um, tend to drink more and use alcohol to cope, you know, with the stress of the work that they have to endure. And so it tells me that it's the system that's the problem and this pay for, for service, this fee for service, you know, model. And oh, by the way, you go into, you know, a medical office or a hospital and there's fast food restaurants, you know, lining all <laughs> the, the children's pay- hospital. Remember that? We the won't children. name names. Uh, the children. The- mm-hmm. So we're starting it out early, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And studies show that patients around people around 10 years old, their arteries are already starting to be clogged. Yeah. 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 There, there was a study done that looked at that. I think three years old, three years old three now, was the youngest mm-hmm. that I, I had seen in a study. Isn't that crazy? It's insane. It's insane. Mm-hmm. The food system is horrible. Yeah. Yes. But they're all making money off of sickness. I mean, that's the, the mm-hmm. and, and burning out, you know, physicians who went to medical school to do the right thing and help people burning mm-hmm. them out in the process. And like I said, right, like I would leave a call shift and I would be racing to get that big burger, Mm -hmm. right, because I'm stressed and I just feel like Mm -hmm. it's going to feed me. Oftentimes what I find myself doing now, because stress is still a big deal, right, I find myself saying, hey, let me get a big leafy green salad. And it might sound Mm -hmm. crazy to some, but I chalk it full of fruits and vegetables, especially my plump blueberries. And those antioxidants, they really start to help me feel better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Instead of craving something that I feel is going to give me comfort momentarily. And I'm not saying don't eat a burger. You can't have a burger, right? But is that really going to help you in the long run? Or mm-hmm. is that going to be momentary relief of your pain <clears throat> and actually cause you years yeah. of pain and hardship? Yeah, well, so I'm going to let Cersei talk because Cersei... No, no, no. You guys keep going. But, you know, I, I just... I think the information is it, it's because it's so much public access that some an individual can can read Dr. Greger's book, can get information for themselves now. It's almost like it's creating its own movement because for that lady to come mm-hmm. in, it was a teaching moment for you through seeing it with your own eyes. Yes. And then you were able to go from there. So we can help. I think the movement is from both sides, from the doctors, but it's also for us taking responsibility for our health and going in and saying, hey, doc, have you seen this study? This is what I'm going to try. And them seeing the evolution before their own eyes, that is even better than just reading it on, on paper. So I thought that was a really powerful, powerful story, but I think we're coming a long way. We're not there yet, but it's, it's, you know, definitely a lot further. So, you know, just to kind of pivot a little bit, which, um, what does, Let's get into, you talked about just the fact that the salads fuel your body. Talk about the role of nutrition with chronic health issues. I think a lot of times people kind of disconnect the power of food. You know, I think we've elevated medication. We've elevated, you know, sometimes even exercise, but where does food play in and what's the role? Sure. So we say that 80 to 90% of chronic diseases can be tied back to lifestyle. And the most important, especially if we're talking about lifestyle medicine pillar, I would say is nutrition. Sleep, I think, is creeping up, then stress. All of them are important, but nutrition is number one. And I am triple board certified in family obesity and lifestyle medicine. And so even when it comes to weight loss and then maintenance of that loss, you need to be sure that nutrition is number one. You cannot outwork or exercise poor nutrition. I try not to use the word diet because diet really sets your mind up to say, okay, this is something that I'm going to do for a short while. I have patients who come in and they're doing two a day exercises, right? Or they're completely restricting their diet to like 500 calories. Now, there are some times where that may be appropriate for a short while. We have some patients who need to change up their nutrition for pre-op prior to doing like a bariatric surgery. But I often recommend that patients see a physician and that they don't go at this on their own and oftentimes meet with a nutritionist in. If resources allow a fitness trainer, but if not, bring it up to your physician or healthcare provider and they can see who's available to assist you in a care team. But it's number one, right? So we really have to be mindful of what we're taking into our bodies. And we talk about the healthcare system and profit, but we also have to be mindful of individuals and companies in the wellness space. Again, especially now in this digital age, because you have people pushing pills and potions and juice cleanses, et cetera. We want to be sure we're focused on whole food, the fruit, the vegetable in its whole state, the whole grain. 
Now, I'm not saying there's not a place for juices. I'm not saying there aren't times for supplementation. I just took my vitamin D this morning. The weather's starting to change. I live in Indiana, the middle of the mat. We always don't get sunlight, especially during the winter times, depending on what hours you work, if you're indoor, et cetera. So there may be times when you do need to supplement, but food should be number one and not just food, but beverages that you intake as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, so I just okay. want to follow up a little bit. So in terms of um, weight loss, because I know this is a big one that many people struggle with. What is your advice there? Because if there's any industry that's oversaturated with, as you call it, gimmicks and, <laughs> you know, this and that. How do you navigate that with your client when it comes to weight loss? Because there is so many competing remedies out there, so to speak. Do this for 30 days, do that. What's mm -hmm. the conversation sound like for you with your client on weight loss? Sure. So it depends on the individual in front of you. There's no one size fits all. There's no quick fix. So I oftentimes, when I see patients for weight management, I take a very deep dive back into childhood to figure out what is the relationship with food? How was food centered in your family? How is it centered today? What diets have you tried? What programs have you done? Have you done medications before? And then I still ask, are you interested in medication or surgery? I'm or certified in obesity medicine. So we believe patients need to know their options. And going back to what you said earlier, I do believe in shared decision-making, but what I often find is patients aren't really used to it. They are used to coming in from yesteryears and what the doctor says goes, right? So when I'm asking them, well, what do you think or what would you like to do? They're looking at me like, well, aren't you the doctor? Yes, I am. But I take my clinical expertise, but you take your life, what your schedule's like, what your resources or financial standpoint is, and how can we create something together that you feel that you can actually do? Realistically, we focus on SMART goals, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic in time goals. All right. So um, when you're looking at roadblocks or when you're talking with your clients or patients about roadblocks, um, what are those major roadblocks for them to take charge of their health? And then how do you help your patients navigate those? Sure. So time, I would say, is a big one for most individuals. We all feel like, well, I don't have enough time to exercise. I don't have enough time to cook. I don't have enough time to go to the grocery store. I'm just going to grab something on my way out. So there's a lot of mindset work that needs to take place. And I would say even on the provider standpoint or physician standpoint, when I was going through my lifestyle medicine training, I, number one, felt like it was helping me change my life, how I related to individuals, staff, patients, family, and even how I was approaching my own health. So that's number one. Then we also have to consider, like I said, financial resources. There are some individuals who may not have the money to buy the latest organic food. And there are some foods that we should consider getting organic over others. But if this is a patient who's trying to figure out how they can afford bus fare, making sure that they can afford their daycare payment for the week, then we don't really want to be pushing, oh, you just need to get organic food or you can only buy this or that or you can't do can, you, you know. We really need to see what does this person have to work with. And again, that takes time. So when you have a physician and a 10-minute visit and they're supposed to gather all this information and help the patient and do an exam, oh, and the patient needs blood work, it's very difficult. And then we wonder why people aren't getting better. So I would say time and financial resources, those are the big two. And then again, it just depends on the patient in front of you. You mentioned working a corporate job. So I work in employer-sponsored healthcare right now, and I do have a lot of patients, not this time of year, budget cuts all over, but who travel significantly. And they say, well, Dr. Gordon, like, I don't get to choose the restaurant that we go to. So what am I supposed to do? So I often say, okay, are you able to often recommend or sometimes recommend? Can you review the menu beforehand? Can you talk to the wait staff or the chef and see what are your options? And I tell patients, listen, if that menu doesn't say no substitutions possible, to me, everything's fair game. And then you don't know until you ask, right? Yeah. Knocking the door shall be open. So it can't yeah. hurt. And if people really want your money, they may consider doing something to help you stay within your recommended nutrition. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can remember navigating that when after I moved to my whole food plant-based lifestyle and I still worked in corporate America for another four years before I mm -hmm. left. And um, it was it was exactly what you suggested. Look at the menu beforehand. Um, sometimes it was just piecing together sides or yeah. 
going, you know, knowing that they have this ingredient, that ingredient, this ingredient, say, Hey, you know, I'm following a special diet, you know, can you make this with these ingredients? And sometimes they're, and as long as you say, I don't care what you charge me, they don't, they don't mind making it. Right. And I've never had a situation where I felt like they overcharged me. That's the funny thing. It was like, they would put it together and I was always like happy and the, and the price was always fair, sometimes even a little low for what I got. Right. And so, you know, um, I thought I, that advice is, is spot on in, in, in my real life application. <laughs> And I also encourage individuals to give feedback to restaurants. So I travel significantly. Mm. And when I go to these places, I mean, even in the hospital cafeteria, it doesn't hurt to give respectful feedback. So I'll say, mm. hey, you know, really be nice if you guys have more plant-based options. And sometimes they ask me, well, what do you think would be good? And then I tell them, obviously, I don't know what they have to go through for procurement, but mm -hmm. at least starting these conversations, most people want to hear what their customers think. Yeah. And I'll tell you, if it's run by Sodexo Marriott, they've got a whole plant-based menu um, for uh, institutional food service. So, uh, and most, most, most cafeterias are run by um, Sodexo. So um, yeah. it's already there. I think maybe the person that's making the choices didn't think to add some of that to the, the specific cafeterias menu. So and the tides are changing. You, are, oh, I went to the mm -hmm. Healthy Fish and Healthy Lives Conference in Napa, California back in 2020, right before the pandemic. So again, I've, I've been in this continual evolvement of my nutrition, and I think most people are, but they have a lot of conferences, and this is through the Harvard THC Chan School of Public Health as well as the Culinary Institute of America. So mm -hmm. chefs are coming, and these are chefs from large restaurants, major restaurant chains who are trying to see how they can optimize the nutrition, but still make sure it tastes good. Because if it doesn't taste good, people won't want to eat it. And so that's another barrier that I see when patients are trying to lose weight. So some of these individuals may not know how to cook. They know how to cook. They're short on time. They need something convenient. They may not have all the latest, greatest appliances in their kitchen. So what the, can they do? And then they may find recipes and they think, or we may recommend it in the healthcare space. And they think, well, where's the flavor? I see patients from all over the world in my current practice. And so I may see someone from Nigeria, Brazil, Canada, Egypt, Morocco, England, et cetera. And so everyone's palate is going to be slightly different. So you talked about moving from that sad standard American diet. And for some individuals, that's not what they have. I mean, we have the blue zones. People are used to eating a more whole food, plant-based nutrition outside of America. So mm -hmm. oftentimes when people come here, they notice that their nutrition takes a deep dive, mm -hmm. right? And then they start noticing that their blood markers are looking worse. So we really have to see, okay, well, what's typical for you? When I see patients, I want a diet right now. And the nurses I work with, they know, I don't just mean, oh, I eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Oh, I may have a snack. Oh, I eat a salad. Okay, you eat a salad. What is that salad comprised of? What type of greens is it made of? Mm -hmm. What dressing do you use? And how much dressing are you putting on there? Do you eat cheese? Okay, how much cheese, right? And not where it's like necessarily, I try not to have it like bim, bim, bim with the questions. But I really want people to start thinking about what we eat because most of us are just mindlessly going through the day eating. When I was in residency, I had longitudinal rotation in obesity medicine. And my attending used to say, you're my little grazer because I was constantly snacking, right? You're a resident, <laughs> you don't have much time, you're constantly on the move. But what am I grazing on? You really should be able to take account of what you mm. consume today, food mm. and beverages. So mm. it starts there. And then when you look, you're like, wow. I took in that many calories, especially liquid calories. You mentioned alcohol. Okay, now I see why I'm not really able to lose the weight like I would hope to, even though I'm constantly in the gym pushing mm. iron. Yeah. Mm. yeah. True. So wow. True. And just shows that the care that you're giving your pa patients, just hearing from what you're saying, just shows what the quality time can do, it can make a difference in the care of the patient. Like, it's night and day because if you're boxed in, like you said, to 10 minutes, it's impossible to get those small details that actually are probably making a big difference in the outcome of their health, you know? So kudos for it you is. to be able to do that. But it makes it difficult to be able to get reimbursed from insurance companies, mm -hmm. right? So, oh, I'm not giving medications. This patient may not have got labs today. And I discuss all this information. Mm -hmm. And no, I don't need, like Dr. Dean Ornish says, 
one recommendation for diabetes, another recommendation for the high cholesterol, another recommend. Most of these chronic diseases, especially when we talk about metabolic syndrome, so insulin resistance, prediabetes, diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and excess weight, overweight, obesity, usually are going to respond to similar nutrition, physical activity, stress management, sleep, lifestyle changes, right? But I would have to significantly detail that in the note, and I do try to, right? But then the insurance company is going to say, uh, but I don't think we need to give you that much money, right? Because uh, you didn't prescribe yeah. this or you didn't. So really the patient didn't need that much of a high level of care coordination. Yeah. That's so, but you yeah. know, what's so weird that, you know, what that, that makes no sense to me because the insurance company should be incentivized to have you do what you did because it means less money being paid out for you know, procedures and medications and, you know, ongoing, it just, it, it's like, they need to be educated on food and medicine. Like, <laughs> but, you know what I'm saying? Right, <laughs> exactly. But just like we said, uh, many doctors aren't, the insurance companies aren't either. Right. They need more of us in positions. And pe these changes are being made. I, I don't want people to hear this and think, oh my God, it's hopeless. No, like change mm -hmm. is happening yeah, because we're happening. becoming more and more aware, but it is slow change, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so you can get reimbursed for the time, but again, yeah. you're Documentation needs to be very detailed and most people do not know how to do that. But you have organizations like the American College of Lifestyle Medicine pushing for it more. Yeah, yeah. And I and I think I think ACLM, the Plantrition Project, mm -hmm. the work that Dr. Neil Bernard is doing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. All those organizations are really making a huge difference in the landscape. And then you've got individuals like Dr. Milton Mills and Yes. Dr. Michael Clapper and mm -hmm. others who are just really Columbus Baptiste, yes, yeah, mm. Columbus Baptiste, and they're just really, you know, in the trenches in terms of looking at it both from an institutional perspective and at a policy, mm -hmm. level, you know, um, and at a grassroots level with because um, uh, Cersei and I were at a Veg Fest in Little Rock and um, we. Oh we gave a talk right before Dr. Mills and our talks coalesced beautifully mm -hmm. and it was unplanned. We didn't plan that to happen because this was our first time meeting him, but it, it just shows you that you, you've got people out there on the front lines, really trying to um, make these changes and there's, and they're happening. We're in the middle of it. You know, yeah, there's yeah. still a lot more work to do, but we're not where we were 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. No. And it takes all of us really working together. That's mm -hmm. my hope to really yep. partner with stakeholders and community members. Cause I can come in and say, you need to eat this. Most people know what they're eating is mm -hmm. not healthy. Yeah. They know changes they need to make, but where do they get the food? How do they figure out how to get these meals planned out? with the time that they have available time in their schedule or what they think is available time. Oftentimes I'm like, well, what about here? You know, we can find ways to open up time in the schedule. Mm -hmm. So it's not that people don't necessarily know what to do. It could be how to do it or how, how much it's going to take to do it. So it really just takes time to have these conversations. And then again, Dr. Milton Mills being there, you all being there, your listeners hearing this video, mm -hmm. taking it back to their providers, taking it to the people at their church. Mm -hmm. And continuing to talk about it so that we can hopefully all heal. Yeah, it's basically an all hands on deck kind of approach. Yeah, that's community, right? Yeah, it's and community. It keeps going back to the blue zones. That's it's, that's how most cultures did it. You know, right. as we continue to become industrialized in communities and nations, yeah. then we started separating right? Yeah, you yeah. don't necessarily have the grandparents in the home, the aunts and uncles, the cousins growing yeah. up together, where we're really sharing in recipes, we're sharing in making the food, we're walking after we eat. You have some populations that do still do that even here in America, but mm -hmm. we need to do more of it. Yeah, Because <laughs> my patients who do that, I see that they really are leading healthier lives. It's so true. And that's why this idea of separating our health in I guess like in North American culture, like you're saying, health is like something completely separate from our personal lives. And so one of the things what Gigi and I are doing is helping people use their faith because faith is a cornerstone for a lot of people. And if we can help them filter how they approach their health through the lens of something that is already important to them that they're they're incorporating into every other aspect of their lives that can be a game changer to 
the way that they approach their health and how they can do this for a long-term benefit. So what, just to kind of pivot on that level, what role do you see faith in for someone to use faith in terms of incorporating that healthy lifestyle mindset and to kind of make it something long-term? I know I've seen you at several conferences on your IG. I've been following you. Just you have a fun IG. You have a fun IG account Thank to you. watch. Just for the record, I'm but. just building it this year. I had another one, separate private one. So I'm just okay. kind of going at, going along yeah. and things changing as as it happens. But yeah, so studies do show that no mm -hmm. matter the religion, people who believe in something mm -hmm. greater or higher than themselves oftentimes fare better, no matter what that diagnosis is, even mm -hmm. at end of life when someone has a terminal disease or illness. So I see it day to day in my patients. Again, like I said, I have a very global patient population. So I'm seeing people from all religious backgrounds, no religion, Christianity, mm -hmm. Hinduism, Islam, mm -hmm. Judaism, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes I'll recommend if someone's kind of stressed, feeling lonely, oh, are you interested in speaking with our behavioral health team? Like you said, care is often disjointed. Mm -hmm. And we have to make sure we're taking care of the whole body. And I'm fortunate to have a care team where we can really do that. And mm -hmm. sometimes the patients will say, oh, no, you know, I just pray. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Right. And I say, pray, read whatever your text is, et cetera. But don't forget that I'm a Christian. OK, I know you guys are also. So God gives us upward right with the Trinity, but he also gives us people beside us. And so we, if we don't feel comfortable speaking with a family member, don't hesitate to reach out to someone else. And there are people who are faith-based and professionally trained to help you. So oftentimes, if we're talking about mental health, I'll refer people to psychologytoday.com. And on that website, you can filter it by different religious backgrounds. And when we're talking about making some of these major lifestyle changes, especially nutrition or moving your body and you have a very negative relationship with how your body looks in exercise clothes or going to the gym, sweat, et cetera, heart rates going up. Am I about to die? I mean, these are real concerns that people have. It starts here, right? It's a continual thing to train your mind. I had very long discussion with colleagues this weekend, even for my own health and well-being. And if you're trying to go that alone, we see it's usually difficult if you don't believe that there's a power greater than you. But thankfully, like you and you, uh, the two of you and I, we know that we are not doing this on our own. Yeah. So um, let's go back to the conversation we were talking about community. And can you share just a little more about the work that you're doing in the community to spread the message of lifestyle medicine? Sure. So grateful to meet with people like you all, individuals like Kelly Nardoni, who is the moderator for my Vegan Women's Summit panel in New York back in May of this year, who are just connecting. I love networking. I love meeting people, getting out in the community, speaking at events, whether that's health fairs and volunteering, whether that's health fairs, church events, grassroots organizations, like you mentioned, and just sharing information. And oftentimes people want to hear what I have to say. But I really like to hear those private conversations. People tell me what they're experiencing and I pull from that. That leads me to go do additional research, look for articles that are backing up what they're saying, following up with those individuals. So that's what I'm doing. Hey, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Janelle. It was such a pleasure um, speaking to you. You're inspirational and just you see just the work that it's evolving in your life, which is a testament to what's happening in the broader lifestyle community. So thank you so much. Thank you. Oh.